Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Rick Dacey, Senior Minister, Wesley Congregational Life. Last week, we began a two-part series, God's Counterterrorism Plan. And we looked at the nature of terrorism and terrorists. Terrorists use fear to intimidate and manipulate and dominate others. And they're very effective at doing that because terrorists themselves, regardless of their ideology, all share one thing in common. Their own lives are dominated and governed by fear. Jesus calls us not to let our lives be dominated and governed by fear. Don't be afraid. He admonishes us again and again. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. Don't be afraid of those who would use fear to intimidate you or manipulate you or dominate you. Instead, stand in trembling awe and wonder before the God who alone has the right and the authority to annihilate you, to cast you off, to cast you out, but who instead values you beyond measure. God's counterterrorism plan starts by moving us from the ground of violence and fear to the ground of faith and love. And Jesus doesn't just teach this, he embodies it. He takes up the cross. He takes up the cross, and he carries the cross, and he plants it in this new ground. The cross that the Romans devise is an instrument of state-sponsored terror. And in love and faith, he transforms the cross's brutal, violent terror into the ultimate sign of hope for all the world. Faith, hope, love, that's our starting point. But God doesn't leave us at the starting point. God is even now implementing his counterterrorism plan, and God intends to engage you and me in that plan. And we see the plan laid out for us. It's it's not a secret. We see it laid out for us very clearly in Paul's letter to the Romans, the 12th chapter. It's not just a plan of abstract ideals. Nice religious thoughts. It's a practical plan for us, Christ's church, to overcome terrorism with the power of God. Before we take a closer look at the text, keep this in mind. God's counterterrorism plan is wholly unlike any human reaction or response to terrorism. I, uh, I witnessed a whole range of reactions and responses to terrorism following 9 11. As I said last week, there was that initial response of, of courage and compassion. In the weeks that followed, following the crisis, we we fell into three primary categories. And, And this is what I saw around me. First and worst was this, hateful fear. And we talked a little bit about this one last week. There were people who were lashing out in their fear, vilifying anyone who looked vaguely of Middle Eastern appearance and calling for massive carpet bombings of whoever, wherever, it doesn't matter. Bomb them all into the Stone Age. Make them pay. Somebody's got to pay. Kill them all. Let God sort them out. Hmm? Which, of course, directly mirrors the hateful fear of the terrorists and hijackers. 
It's the same mentality mirrored right back. For all the chest-pounding bravado, when you hear someone react like this, you take this to the bank. They are absolutely gripped with fear. A second response that I witnessed, as it slowly became clear that Al-Qaeda had committed this act of senseless terror, or some people who were trying to re- respond with, with some sort of reasoned diplomacy. Let's, let's try and make sense of this, this chaos. Let's try and make some sense of it. Let's put it in a, a reasonable context. I heard some people saying things like, if we could just understand why they hate us, if we could just understand we could sit down and maybe we could talk with them and and work out some sort of peaceful settlement. The problem is that there is no sense to be made of a horrific act of terror. There's no sense in it. Reasoning with terrorists is an exercise in futility because terrorism has nothing to do with reason. Reasoning with terrorists doesn't make sense. Terrorists rationalize their acts. They sometimes have elaborate rationalization for their acts of terror. But terrorism is itself inherently irrational. It flows not from reason, but from fear. And that's why you can't simply reason with terrorists... You can't reason someone out of what they didn't reason their way into. Let me say that again. You can't reason someone out of something that they didn't reason their way into. A third reaction that I witnessed, we all witnessed, was military force. Seeking to overcome terrorism by force of arms. Now, I want to say that I have the deepest, most profound respect for men and women who put on a uniform and are prepared to sacrifice, to be put in harm's way for the freedom and for the security and safety of others. Those who have faced the hell and horrors of war deserve a whole lot more than we have given them. But it's been 15 years now It's been 15 years now that the Western democracies have been engaged in this global war on terror. Thousands and thousands of terrorists have been killed. Thousands and thousands of servicemen and women have given their lives. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of civilians have been caught in the crossfire. And I ask you, do you feel that the world is any safer from terrorism today than it was at the beginning of this global war? The fact is, terrorism can never be defeated by force of arms. It it can be suppressed by force, but it can never be overcome by force. It's like a noxious weed. You can cut it down and it grows back. You can cut it down here and it grows over there. As long as the roots are intact and the soil is fertilized with fear, it will sprout up again and again and again and who knows where. And if you poison the ground and try and kill the weed, know that you're going to kill more than the weed. And the weed will find some way to survive. And it will crop up again. What we need is not more poisoned ground. What we need is new ground. Fresh, new soil for something new, wholly new to grow. And that's at the heart of God's counterterrorism plan. 
Unlike all our human reactions and responses, God's response, and only God's response, has the power to overcome evil. God's plan is rooted and grounded in the fresh new soil of love. Now, someone right now is is dismissing this as soft and weak, naive. Remember that this is not love as a fickle human emotion. This is the infinitely powerful, world-transforming love of God. Remember that this is the power that enabled the early church to flourish in the face of violent persecution. Remember that this is the power that enables persecuted Christians in our world today to stand up in faith. Genuine love is immensely powerful. Immensely powerful. Remember the cross. The cross where the soldiers had had whipped Jesus, they had mocked him, they had beaten him, they nailed his bruised and bloody body to a, a wooden beam, and then they hung him up as a terrifying warning to others. And what was Jesus' response? He prayed for their forgiveness. Weak. Naive. The Romans, the Romans thought they had all the power. Everyone else thought the Romans had all the power. Everyone but Jesus. Jesus knew where the power was. He refused to fight on the Romans' ground of fear. He met them instead on the ground of love, praying, Father, Forgive them. And look and see love's transforming power. Look at at what it does. It's not just an idea. Look at the impact. Look at the centurion. The centurion, a man who, uh, who just a few hours earlier would have been torturing Jesus and spitting in his face, laughing, mocking, Beating. The centurion, a man who literally has the blood of terror on his hands. The centurion stands at the foot of the cross and he witnesses the love of Christ and he is changed. Look at the impact it has on him. The scripture tells us that he praises God. This is the power of God's counterterrorism plan. This is the power of God's love. Let love be genuine. The NIV translate it, translates it, let love be sincere. The Greek is, is stronger than that, I'm sorry. It's not just a, a, a sense of hmm, sincere good intentions in our love. No, he's saying, let love be authentic so it's unmistakable, so no one can miss it, so the centurion at the foot of the cross can't miss it. Let love be the real deal, authentic, genuine, not a cheap knockoff. Let love be all that Jesus revealed it to be. On that ground, the apostle lays out God's counterterrorism plan here in Romans 12. It's not a bunch of lofty ideals, it's a practical plan. It's a real life, live it out now plan. And you and I, we're gonna go, we're gonna go through this together so that you and I can get stuck into it right away. God's plan is framed by these two verses. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, and do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As Jesus revealed to us, we have the power to overcome evil. We have it. 
And that power is the love of God. And love is woven all through this plan, beginning with our relationships in the church. Be devoted to one another in love. If, you know, if we can't authentically love one another in the community of the church, then we have nothing to share beyond the church. This is love 101. Love in, in God's love in the, in the ideal conditions, the incubator of love. And somebody's saying right now, oh, it's hard enough. It's hard enough in the church. God's not done. God's not done. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. See, love isn't something that, that happens in here. Love isn't something that happens in here. Love is something that happens. It's a lived out commitment that happens in the space between me and another, between you and others. It's a lived out commitment. And that love needs to be nurtured and nourished by our whole spiritual life. It's not something we can hive off. It's something woven through our whole life. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Love is not only spiritual, it's tangible. It's, it's material. And, and here, pay attention to the end of this verse. It, it's easy to gloss over this. It reads in the English, practice hospitality. Here again, that's, that sounds pretty innocuous, doesn't it? Practice hospitality. Oh, finally, here's something we can, we can manage. The rest of it has been pretty hard so far, but we can practice hospitality. In fact, this is the hinge point in God's counterterrorism plan. Up to now, the apostle has primarily been talking about how we are to love one another in the community of the church. But now watch the circle widen. Here again, the, the English translation is weaker than the original Greek. Practice hospitality. We, you know, we might think that means, oh, we put out a plate of biscuits. Job done. Right? No. No. The Greek has a much stronger sense here. It, it, it's, not, it's not just about practicing hospitality as we think about it. The, the Greek says, pursue love. Hmm? Love. Pursue love of strangers. It has this, this active power to it. Pursue love of strangers, of those who are other, of people you don't know, people you may not understand, people you may not want to know or understand. Pursue love of strangers. This is what it means to practice hospitality. Uh, this plan is, is getting harder. But God's not done. God's not done. Bless those who persecute you. Mm. And now we see the power in God's plan. Our human reactions to terrorism are rooted and grounded in either fear or denial. But God's moving us onto new ground. Bless those who persecute you. And, and just in case, lest we, we miss it, lest we gloss over it, the apostle emphasizes again, bless and do not curse. As if that weren't enough for us. <laughs> God has more. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. I mean, we, could, we could preach a sermon series on any one of these imperatives. This is what genuine, authentic love looks like in action, in practice. But then Paul says this, do not repay anyone 
evil for evil. Hmm. Now this is really hard. Do not repay anyone. Anyone. I mean, it sure would be handy if Paul had made a, uh, this a little less comprehensive, a little less all-encompassing. If he had included some exceptions or an escape clause, something to, to get us off the hook. Because, you know, when I see evil, when I see lives, innocent lives taken, when I see families and communities torn apart, when I see workers dragged from their homes, when I see aid workers beheaded, when I see children turned into walking weapons, when I see women enslaved, my human response says, return evil for evil. Repay. But God's not done with me. Praise God. God's not done with me. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, this is important. It's, there are a couple of qualifiers here. They don't get us off the hook, but they're important qualifiers. If it is possible, you know, it's not always possible to live at peace with everyone. Some people will not live at peace with us. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you. See, if we thought, oh, well, if it's sometimes not possible, we might maybe want to get ourselves off the hook. No, no. In God's plan, we're squarely on the hook, church. So far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Hmm. As far as it depends on you. You and I cannot force anyone to live at peace with us. All we can do is to be faithful, rigorously faithful to our calling. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then the apostle continues, do not take revenge. My dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For as it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord which would be hard enough if it meant don't get personally involved, just let God sort it out. But in fact, God does call us to get personally involved, not in acts of vengeance, but in acts of love. On the contrary, Paul writes, and quoting from Proverbs, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Hmm. Now those hot coals, they're not a form of, of backhanded, passive-aggressive vengeance. In showing genuine, authentic love to those who seek to intimidate or manipulate or dominate us with terror, we are exercising the same transforming power that led a centurion to praise God at the foot of the cross and to say, surely this is a righteous man. Surely this is a son of God. That's God's counterterrorism plan, all spelled out for us, clear, practical, straightforward, and powerful. So church, hear this. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. There it is. All tied up. Are we ready to go and live it now? <laughs> I hear one yes, and I see a lot of... <laughs> hmm. There's someone sitting here tonight thinking, nope, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And far from feeling ready to overcome, I'm feeling overwhelmed. There's someone in this room who's feeling stuck 
in those human reactions who just can't imagine living out the God's plan of life change, changing, world transforming love. That can't be us. Lord, look at us. If that's you, if you're that person, take heart. You're not alone. The person next to you is feeling the same way. And so is the person in front of you and the person behind you and the person up front preaching the sermon. God's plan for us is a hard plan. It's a hard plan for all of us. In fact, it is humanly impossible. Thank God that we are not limited by what is humanly possible. We close tonight. We close tonight with the, this verse from the, the, the very beginning of the 12th chapter. Now hear this. If you're that person who's feeling stunned and overwhelmed, hear this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what frames all that is to follow. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our human reactions to terrorism follow the pattern of this world, don't they? We fall right into line. Living God's counterterrorism plan demands that we be transformed and renewed. But don't miss this. Don't miss this now, church. Notice that the word is not, it is not transform and renew your mind. This is not the imperative. It's not you go transform and renew your mind. Get yourself sorted out. It's be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's not our will and our work that will make this possible. It is God's will and God's work that operates through us, that transforms us and renews us. It is God's work, God's will in us and through us that enables us to break free of our human reactions and responses. It is God's will and God's work in us and through us that empowers us to overcome evil with good. May his power be at work within us this very night as we leave this room, as we begin practicing the love that we are called to. And may we live our lives this week transformed and renewed in his love. Amen. <laughs>